All right, welcome back to Computer Science 50. This is the start of week nine. So I、uh, was convinced by a former CS50 teaching fellow to buy this here shirt from Satire 5.、Uh, visit them on the web at satirev.com, which happens to be a former CS50 student's final project from last year. I then, after opening my wallet, just 10 minutes later, was then generously given a free t shirt from the、uh, women's ultimate frisbee team. Uh, which is, I'm told, better than this t shirt I'm wearing. So I will put this one on during break, and I'm sure these things are available on sale to you outside. And there's the women's ultimate frisbee team. So, a couple of announcements. So, the big board for problem set six has rather wrapped up. Uh, although some folks have continued to challenge it a bit, once we have started looking over all the numbers and the code, we'll let you know exactly what we thought of some of the implementations.、Um, needless to say, some, apparently we won.、Um, <laughs> I did notice walking over here earlier that we had some interesting processes running in the cloud that were owned by teaching staff.、Um, by contrast, just for good measure, let me show you that,、uh, let's see, board.php, I believe, is our file. Nope. I'll just scroll down. So currently, in last place, is our own、uh, teaching fellow, Ken Pereno. <laughs> It was apparently spell checking things by hand at 2600 seconds. So, congratulations to him as well. But today we release a new big board for problem set seven. Some of you have already hopped on there. So, a couple of words on this. Problem set seven challenges you with implementing your own、uh, copy of CS50 Finance, a sort of e trade like site where you'll be able to grab、uh, stock quotes in near real time from yahoo.com, allow users to register for accounts, get $10,000 in their portfolio. Portfolio and then buy and sell stocks. What you can also do as a fun aside is also challenge this big board by following the link to our own implementation of CS50 Finance, following the link to play this big board, and you'll be logged in ultimately under your own username. And you can have your current stock portfolio's value displayed for all to see on the course's website simply by following that link. And as well on the home page, do we have an implementation of CS50 Stock Trader by one of our teaching fellows as an additional so sample solution as well? The walkthrough from Cato will be tonight at 6 p.m.、Uh, we realize that we have done a crash course essentially, crash course essentially in PHP,、uh, SQL, and this week JavaScript and Ajax, but that is precisely the point to give you a taste of these languages, to in lecture give you a, a conceptual framework for tackling this and the final problem set eight, which will be due in a couple of weeks' time, so that you can play around in a completely new world, but appreciate for yourselves just how accessible other languages and technologies. Are after this course. So, final projects.、Uh, it's quite amusing to see one final project pre proposal come in maybe Thursday, maybe Friday, then a few dozen came in Saturday, a few dozen more on Sunday, and then about 100 on、uh, Monday around noon. So, my, my phone has indicated as much.、So、that's good because it suggests some thought. What you'll notice on the course's website now are links to seminars. So, no, there's currently no text on this page. What has happened? Typo on my part. Seminars is a, a list of,、um, watch this, within minutes, this will magically get fixed, I'm sure, yes? That link on the left. So we have offered, thanks to the Teaching Fellows, an amazing roster of seminars, which are optional classes that we'll offer sometime between now and winter break, whereby you can get crash courses,、um, you can、uh, crash courses in a whole variety of topics, some of which might be quite apropos for your own final project. So, for instance, accepting payments with PayPal and Google was a seminar that will be led by Mike Tucker, if you'd like to integrate something like that. The Android phone、uh, will be led by Brett Thomas. We've got ones on computational biology. Uh, Facebook applications, Firefox add ons,、uh, Java, Ruby on Rails, and a whole bunch of others. And in addition, we filmed many of the seminars last year and have already made those available as videos. So the point of these is to supplement what you might find available online in the form of tutorials, but so that you know you have a resource this year in the terms of the teaching fellows who are wonderfully experted,、um, wonderfully, wonderful experts in a whole range of topics. And that's precisely what these seminars are designed to do for you. So Do RSVP to the appropriate TF there, and they will let you know when and where things will happen. 
All right, what else we got? On the course's homepage, you will find a few other links, one of which refers to this process, which, believe it or not, is about to begin. Uh, the scarce is almost over, right? We do have a couple pro、uh, problem sets left and one final project and a little old quiz coming up, but we've already begun, as of this morning,、um, recruiting for fall 2009's teaching fellows, CAs, and graders. So if you are interested in keeping CS50 in your life next year in a very positive way,、um, how many of you are eyeing the tablet at this moment, perhaps?、Uh, no promises there,、um, but do follow the link on the course's homepage to apply if interested. And in addition, if you like this web stuff we're doing or already have some background in it, know that in the spring I'll be teaching a course at Harvard's Extension School called Building Dynamic Scalable Websites, which is really a continuation of the stuff we've scratched the surface of in this course. It's a course on LAMP, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP,、uh, in AJAX, and similar technologies. And it's a Project based course for extension students. So, if you might be interested in that, also follow the instructions on our homepage as to how to express your interest. And finally, on final projects for you. Um, we have, in an effort to, make,、uh, to maximize the probability that some of your final projects outlive CS50, is we've signed up for a commercial web hosting server、uh, through DreamHost, which is a pretty popular and fairly economical option out there these days.、Um, the goal here is that for any of you implementing web based final projects, which is by no means a requirement, you certainly need not do that,、um, but if you choose to do that and you would like your project to live on beyond January, well, the course will commit to hosting at no charge to you guys、um, those web. Websites provided you buy your own domain for $6, $10 for at least 12 months. So you don't have to worry about that detail. And this will allow, us, this will allow you to keep something up and running ideally after courses end. So a whole bunch of fun stuff there、uh, mentioned on the course's homepage. So where, are, where did we leave off last time? Well, a quick tale about what the significance of this slide is. So we focused on PHP and SQL, although certainly in no great detail, mostly on some of the conceptual aspects of it. But there's something worth noting.、Um, if you go up to an ATM machine in the real world and you put in your card, you enter your PIN, and then you push the button for fast cash and you've asked for $20 or $40. Well, there's some interesting CS challenges that you're faced with, or the implementers of that ATM are faced with. Namely, at, they have to figure out how to, one, dispense money to you, and then, two, update their own database. And the problem here is you kind of want both of those things to happen or not at all. In the one case, you lose money. In the other case, you annoy the customer or create a customer service nightmare. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, suppose the customer punches in $20 and hits OK, give me $20. Well, if that ATM machine, for instance, spits out the $20 and then the user yanks the power cord or there's some kind of malfunction and the bank never updates its own database, well, they have no record then of the fact that they've spit out $20. So they're $20 in the hole and you walk away with a free $20 because it's not been debited from your account. Now, conversely, suppose that they first deduct $20 from their database for you, but then the server crashes and you never actually get your money. So now, This is probably the bank,、uh, this is probably、uh, error in bank's favor. Actually, what is the error in Monopoly? $20? Error in bank favor? Perhaps a coincidence there.、Um, not intended, anyhow.、Um, Why, what's the implication then? Well, the user, the customer is presumably ticked off. And then it actually does cost the bank money in some sense because you have to pick up the phone, customer service, and so forth. So there's this problem here of.、Um, auto, um, Of the operation needing to be atomic. And by atomic, we mean both things have to happen together or not at all. You can't have one happen, then a moment's delay, and the other. But this is sort of a fundamental problem of computing because even though we see our own computers giving us the illusion of multiple things happening at once, we know already from weeks ago that they're really just moving so fast and toggling between this program and this program, but ultimately doing one thing at a time on their CPU. That makes this actually a difficult problem. Now, this is particularly related even to CS50 finance, whereby you too have to, for instance, take money from the user's、uh, cash account and then give them shares, but you either want both of those things to happen or not at all. Otherwise, the exact same problem exists. They get free shares or they lose money. So you don't have to worry about this too much in this particular problem set, but certainly for final projects, and if you're trying to commercialize a final project or something beyond this course, these are very important sort of ideas to keep. In mind. And you can take a whole course on stuff like this, namely、uh, Computer Science 61, or more to the point, 
Computer Science 161, Operating Systems, because operating systems need to deal with this kind of stuff all the time. In SQL, in MySQL specifically, there do exist statements that the database itself guarantees to be atomic. And here are just two excerpts. And we mention these in the problem set spec so that you can just use them, but you don't necessarily have to worry too much about how they work. But know moving forward that you yourself can guarantee that sequences of operations are in fact atomic. So know for now that MySQL, like many databases, supports what are called transactions, which is the name kind of conjuring up the idea of the ATM suggests, simply means that you can say literally execute the query, start transaction, then do anything you want, and only once you then execute the commit command does everything you just did actually get written to disk, so to speak? Does it all actually happen? And it all happens together or not at all. And these are particularly hard for, say, the implementers of MySQL or some microsystems to implement, but easy for you to invoke. So realize that this exists, but realize parenthetically that as you play with PHP MyAdmin, you'll be given choices in various drop down menus. Do you want InnoDB? Do you want MyISAM? Do you want Heap or Memory? There are different table types, engines as they're called. And just know that if you decide to sort of think about problems like this or have to deal with them in your final projects, InnoDB is the engine that you need to use if you want this kind of functionality. But there are some interesting implications if you read up on it, namely for performance. So what are you going to do in CS50 Finance? Well, you're going to first implement, we've implemented for you a login feature. You're going to supplement it with the ability for users to register by filling out a form, hitting enter, and voila, they get a username and password. You're going to implement the ability to get stock quotes, to sell stocks, buy stocks, and then also peruse a user's history. So for instance, if I go ahead and log in to our own staff solution, cs50.net, and click on the link to CS50 Finance. And I go ahead and register, for instance, as Malin, uh, who is my, oh, play the big board, as David J. Malin. So I've logged in. Here's my portfolio. I have $10,000 at the moment automatically. Let's go ahead and get a quote. Let's see how Google's doing today. Get a quote. And what that has just done behind the scenes, which frankly is kind of neat in that it's relatively easy for you to do, is it executed an HTTP request from our cloud servers over to uh, Yahoo.com, literally finance.yahoo.com, queried it for Google stock ticker symbol, got a whole bunch of numbers back, and then we spit out only the actual price. And if you read through the problem set spec and look through the distribution code, you'll see exactly how this is going on. Let me go ahead and try to buy this thing. So it's pre-populated the form field with Goog. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just buy one share so that I have plenty of money left over. And now you'll see that my portfolio updates itself. And then later, and herein lies some of the potential fun, especially in the um, financial crisis of today, uh, we can see just how well or how poorly you do by, say, the course's final lecture. So I have committed to buying one share of Google. Oh, there we go. It's already back up to a dollar. That's excellent. And Austin apparently signed in this morning and has already made himself uh, $235. So feel free to load up on penny stocks. Um, in fact, if you've read the spec, you'll know that I excerpted from my own spam folder a, um, a phishing sort of thing where people were trying to uh, get you to buy some penny stock. Well, last year, I think the penny stock in question was 20 cents. And it literally was from a recent email in fall 2008 that I pasted it into the spec. Well, I had to go back in and change the spec this year because, one, the SEC has halted trading on that particular stock ticker symbol. And rather than even being 20 cents, it was like 0 .0007 cents per share. Um, not particularly uh, the happiest time for the company we chose last year. So we picked a new random one, Harris Expl uh, Exploration, uh, who is not currently doing very well either, per the spec. So uh, where does that leave us? With today. So I thought it'd be fun to take problem set six, which many of you spent 5, 10, 15, 20 plus hours fighting with, and implement it in about two minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and SSH, let's say, was that the wrong thing to say? <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and uh, SSH to one of the course's servers here. All right, uh, CS50. All right, let's go into our lectures directory. This is week nine, source. And what you'll notice in the misspellings, misspellings directory, which you do have a copy of in your handout today, is a whole bunch of PHP code in a file called Speller. So you do have a printout of this. And I won't walk us through all of this, because what you'll actually find is that it's pretty much a line-for-line -line translation from C 
into PHP code. So I would recommend that you glance at this on your own at home just by literally taking problem set 6's speller.c, which you weren't supposed to change, hold it up side by side with this one, and just kind of notice or reassure yourself that, wow, the leap from C to PHP, not all that hard. In fact, almost all of the functions we used in the C version of this program existed in PHP. So it really didn't take me long to map things back and forth. Some of the syntax is different, to be sure. We said on、uh, last week that dollar sign denotes what in the context of a PHP program? Yeah, so it's a variable. So there's little syntactic differences, but for the most part, it's the same program and it does the same kind of timing of my code. Well, what I did notice at the top of this, just like we did in speller.c, is I required a file called dictionary.ph. And so it's in here that I isolated my implementation of a dictionary. So let me show you how I went about implementing a dictionary. So I have what appears to be a global variable called size, initialized to zero, and then my dictionary object. So I needed to decide what data structure should. I use, just like you did, in order to implement a dictionary. Well, per our conversation last week, PHP gives you for free hash tables, aka associative arrays, which allow you to store arbitrary key value pairs, just using some familiar array like syntax. So, this is all it took for me to declare at the top of my file as a global an empty dictionary. Okay, similar to you initializing a null pointer, as many of you did. Well, now let's look at the load function. Now, there's this nuisance in PHP whereby if you have a global variable, Functions can't actually see it unless you tell the function this is a global variable. So I have this one line of code here that just says, by the way, these two things are global variables, they're not local. All right? So now I just do this. If、uh, f open returns false, let's just return false because that's not all that interesting. But take a look at this. I reuse fscanf, which many of you used, reading from this file handle, reading in a string using the percent %s format string, and I'm reading it into the variable called word. So, if you look at the syntax for fscanf, and remember the rule of thumb、uh, for this next problem set is going to be if you want to look something like this up, Google is your friend, PHP,、um, f open, top hit is usually the one you want, and voila, there's the so called manual page for it in PHP manual, and a whole bunch of examples, and even people with a lot of free time comments on it, a la a wall.、Um, it's actually kind of useful because folks talk about interesting cases. So, how do I put a word in the dictionary, right? This is probably what most of you struggled with for many hours, certainly to chase down all your bugs. Well, it turns out if I want to store this word in my dictionary, that's it. So, dictionary, square brackets, the word, that is the key I want to store. And then why do you think I'm just setting that value to true? I just want to be able to do the same operation again and say if dictionary bracket word. Then that means what? If it's true, that means the word was put in there. So the beauty of this in PHP, as in other high level languages like it, is that you don't have to worry about the underlying implementation details. Someone else has implemented hash tables with separate chaining or coalesce chaining or whatever it is the authors of PHP decided to do. You don't have to worry so much about pointers and references and all of the low level details that very intentionally did we have you do for problem set six. But now, once you sort of understand these things and understand the implications of performance for using a structure, Like this. Well, now it's just one of the proverbial tools in your toolkit that if you need a hash table, voila, just declare the array, start plopping things in it, and now we have a struct containing all of our words. Now, what do I apparently, what am I not worrying about here that you probably did have to worry about in your own hash table implementation? What's that? So, freeing space, so and you'll see that my unload function really has nothing to do because there's no notion in PHP, at least so far as you're concerned, of heap versus stack. Your memory is, all, is managed for you. But what, it, what was another headache, perhaps, when you implemented a hash table for problem set six? So, overflow of what? So, buffer size. So, if you ran out of space, if you were using,、um, for instance, linear probing or something like that, and related to this, what was one of the, what's the fundamental challenge of implementing an efficient hash table? Collisions, right? Minimizing collisions. Am I even considering collisions here? No, I mean, this is what PHP does for me. An associative array's own implementation deals with that for me. Now, what does it mean to check if something's in here? Well, look at this. The whole damn check function is four lines of code besides the global declaration. If dictionary, and I'm calling stir to lower because you were told to make the thing case insensitive, stir to lower of word is true, 
return true, else return false. That's all it takes to do a lookup. You just check the same index that you put the thing in before. Size is even tr more trivial, but much like it was in C. Similarly, is unload for us pretty simple. So let's see if this thing actually works. In, back in Speller, there's one interesting thing I did. We said last week that every PHP file has to start with open bracket question mark PHP, although the PHP uh, letters are optional usually. But notice this thing up top. So this is actually important and useful. And you'll likely use this in the last problem set. So, this is what's kind of goofily called a shebang, S H E B A N G, because you have a sharp symbol and a bang, an exclamation point. So, that's what, that's what the geeks call it. So, it's a shebang. What does this mean? Well, this is just a hint to your operating system, essentially, as to what interpreter it should use to execute this file. So, recall that we had that brief discussion last week, and the problem set really walks you through the notion of chmod, so changing a file's permissions. And notice that very intentionally have I given executability to this file. I've specifically said chmod 700, or actually 755, so that you all can execute it as well. And that means I can read, write, and execute it. And this means that you, anyone, can read and execute it. But not write it. So the implication of that is that I can run the command speller, even though it's not compiled, there's that hint at the very top line that tells the operating system, oh, by the way, when the user runs this executable file, run this program, that is, run this thing, which is an interpreter, much like GCC is a compiler. And what the interpreter's job in life is to do is to look at every line following the shebang and interpret it line by line by line. So, what are the implications for performance? Did we say last week of interpreted languages versus compiled? So, it's slower in interpreted language. So, let's see if we can actually back that claim up. Let me go ahead and run, let's say, let me go to the cloud for a moment. So, I'll go over to mailin at cloud.cs50.net. Okay, let me temporarily get a copy of, oh, so let's just run the staff solutions. So pub solutions, pset 6, and speller. And I'm going to run this on CS50, pub uh, share, pset 6, texts, and let's do it on, let's say, the King James Bible, because it's a really big file. All right, so let's run this. Okay, a whole bunch of stuff's going to flow past. Let's see what the end result is. So incidentally, the running time of the staff solution is not actually this bad. If you look at the numbers, apparently what you just saw scroll past only took 0.6 seconds. So this discrepancy is the fact that it's a lot slower to print stuff to the screen, but it's actually very fast using our implementation to spell check the file. So we don't keep track of how long it takes to spit out bits to the screen. We only keep track, recall, of the, the time involved in your check and your load and so forth functions. So that's the discrepancy there. So our solution, like some of yours, ran in 0.6 seconds for this thing, time in total. Well, now let's go back to my PHP implementation. I'm going to go ahead and run Speller, and I'm going to run it also on King James the fifth. Enter. Whoops, Speller not found. There we go. Little shell trick to get that to work. Let's see what happens here. And again, ignore the time it takes to actually spit these characters across the screen. But let's see what the final tally is. So 2.75 seconds. So if you've ever been told, for instance, by me last week that interpreted languages are slower, that is indeed a valid claim. Now granted, I could go back in and tweak my performance, maybe optimize a few calls here and there. But unlike C, you don't have much control over these things in PHP. And so if, you if it comes time to implement some program after this course for, say, a job, for a research project, for a business, well, it's actually important to be mindful of these kinds of things. So Facebook, again, to use this example, since you're all familiar with it, is its front end is driven largely by PHP. But odds are, over the years, they have implemented or re-implemented a lot of stuff behind the scenes, a lot of the database stuff in something like C or C++, or likely, just conjecture, a compiled language, because you get this performance benefit because you're much closer to the hardware. And as you've seen in, say, problem set six, that gives you a lot more control 
over what you're doing. Now, for web stuff, where it's just a human being interacting with the website, these pages are still going to execute in just milliseconds, and that's plenty fine. But if you start to make a website that has millions of users and thousands of hits per second, well, then these kinds of design decisions actually come back to bite you, potentially. And then you need to begin, say, version 2.0 of your code. So, one of the discussions we'll have in a couple of weeks' time is these issues of scalability and performance. And if you're sort of toying with the idea of starting some startup at some point in the future that's somehow technology driven, there's going to be a whole bunch of interesting, if, if non obvious, questions to ask yourself,、um, some related to performance, some money, some language. So, we'll chat. About some of those things. So, a look now toward where we're going with all this stuff and what problem set eight is going to entail. So, RSS, how many of you use RSS readers or feeds? All right, so a bunch of you. These,、uh, RSS in a sentence is just what? Don't just tell me what the acronym is. What is it in real terms? It's like a URL that you probably pasted into what Google Reader or whatever it is you use. All right, so what is RSS? RSS is a file format that's actually XML, extensible markup language. Now, what does this mean? It just means that an RSS feed or an RSS file is just a big text file that someone could have even whipped up with Nano if they wanted, but often they are automatically generated. What is in an RSS feed? Well, information that you might want to syndicate. So, a lot of news sites, the New York Times and the like, actually syndicate. Indicate their news in RSS format so that you don't have to go to NewYorkTimes.com and click and web pages and read articles in HTML format. Rather, you can essentially download just the text version of it and use whatever program you want to actually display that information. It means you can integrate the New York Times' articles into your own website, into your own client, into any number of pieces of software. So, RSS, simple as it is, really simple syndication is one of the、um, pronunciations of its acronym,、um, is in Increasingly popular because it's this open file format. And we bring this up now because problem set seven. CS50 Finance is already making use of something that's XML based. So, what we did, partly for fun, but partly to clean up some of the names in problem set seven, is not only do we get stock quotes from yahoo.com, we also go and get a bunch of news articles from msn.com. And also from msn, do we get a different version of companies' names? Because we found just empirically that Yahoo tends to format companies' names corresponding to stock symbols in kind of an ugly fashion. Well, we found that msns were better, so we grab both data sources and merge them. And all of this happens, you'll see, in the file called helpers.php. So we'll walk you through that in the problem set spec. Now, for problem set eight, the context is going to be this notion of a mashup. So these two are very much in vogue, but offer interesting opportunities for, for thought and, sort of some, and certainly computer science ideas. So you will take Google Maps, you will take Google News, and you will mash them together, so to speak. And the motivation for this is the following. So a couple years ago, Um, I sadly、uh, sat outside of a circuit city from roughly 8 p.m. to like 8 a.m. with a friend in December、um, because he wanted to be among the first to get a Wii,、uh, a Nintendo Wii. So <laughs> I was there partly to keep him company and partly because he wanted to get two. <laughs> Um, one for himself, one for his siblings.、Um, and I bring this up now because I, like an idiot, you know, bought it for him. He paid me back and I gave him the Wii. And then I proceeded to spend the next like, multiple months trying to get one myself without going back online in the middle of the night because, as you know, they've been rather hard to get. But anyhow, this is just a completely irrelevant.、Um, Uh, anecdote leading up to the point of this story, which is that the Wii, if you've ever seen it, has a news channel. And this news channel is interesting, not so much because you can read the news, because it's not the most efficient way to read the news, but it's got a really sexy interface whereby you can see a globe of the Earth. You can see a globe. You can then zoom in on different cities and different areas and see stacks of newspapers representing various news articles pertaining to that zip code or pertaining to that city. So to paint this picture, let me give us a Few seconds worth of this demo that someone decided would be fun to put on YouTube. I know, right? Okay, we could have cut that part out. All right, so you got some menus, you choose some news. Frankly, one of the neatest user interface things I've ever seen, if you've never seen the Wii do this, is how it does text resizing in a moment. Also irrelevant, but interesting. 
Wow. And now the relevant part should be coming up. So you have this globe, and each of these icons represents a collection of news articles. This too is the cool part about uh, the Wii's news channel, that thing. You have to wonder what the guy was trying to do by recording this too. See if it's going to get any more interesting. There we go. Come on. All right. So each of those things, there's a whole lot of news in Washington, D.C., for instance. And there, as you sort of zoom to different parts, more and more articles, more and more links actually appear on the screen. So for problem set eight, um, perhaps deceptively, you're not going to implement that. But you are going to implement. <laughs> something like it. So there is Google Earth now, but Google Earth only supports Windows right now for its browser plugin. So once Mac OS exists, we'll actually probably do something like this with Google Earth. But Google Maps exists right now and allows us to use JavaScript code to implement something very much like that. And so one of the, ch the ultimate challenge of problem set 8 for you is going to be to integrate into a web page that you design a copy of Google Maps and write some PHP code as well as some JavaScript code as well as some uh, SQL queries so that when the user, whether it's you or a friend who's playing with your problem set, browse it or clicks and drags Google, or, uh, Google Map to say a certain city or to a different country, what will automatically appear on the screen thanks to your code will be a whole bunch of place marks, a whole bunch of icons representing news articles corresponding to that zip code. Well, where are those articles going to come from? Well, Google Maps, nicely enough, supports um, geotagging and GPS coordinates. And we're going to provide you with a SQL database that's going to convert zip codes to geographic coordinates. So that what's going to happen is the user clicks and drags the map to, say, New York City. That triggers a JavaScript call, an AJAX call, as we'll see, to your backend server, to our web server, where you're going to have some PHP code running. Your PHP code is going to check from the web page, well, what are the current uh, geographic coordinates, GPS coordinates that the user is at? Let me do a quick look up in my MySQL database for the zip code corresponding to that. Now let me query Google News, different website altogether, for all of the news articles related to that zip code. And what you're going to get back is a whole bunch of this stuff, a, whole, a big RSS feed containing, if there are any news articles from that zip code, relevant news. And what you'll then do using this combination of more PHP and JavaScript is re render, is present those news articles in the form of links to the user embedded nicely on top of the Google map. You can do really neat things, as you've probably seen with Google Maps. You might have seen mashups involving Craigslist, for instance, that shows you where current apartments are available by way of a Google map. Uh, another neat one that's rather timely is this one that someone made during the election and even after, whereby they've Im embedded into their web page a Google map of the United States. They've used some fancier tricks than we'll use for this problem set to overlay red and blue colors on the appropriate states. But what you can then do is click on something like Idaho, and it will actually zoom in on the map, and it will show you that there's a few holdouts of Democrats in the state, and it will actually show you how the vote went there. And this is all using Google's freely available code, freely available um, libraries, and what's generally called an API. And that's ultimately the takeaway of this problem set, is not just to play around with something that's trendy, but also to introduce you to this notion of um, integrating your own work into publicly available data and publicly available APIs, which is increasingly common. And this means that other people have done a lot of interesting work. You are able to patch into it and solve interesting problems more quickly as a result. So, JavaScript. JavaScript is like PHP, an interpreted language, but it doesn't get executed by servers. It doesn't get executed, in, interpreted by servers, but rather by clients. Now, what do we mean by this? Well, we've seen last week that when you write a PHP file, it does its thing um, on the web server, generates a whole bunch of XHTML, and it's the XHTML that's spit out to the user's browser. The user's browser never sees open bracket question mark in the form of PHP tags. 
By contrast, JavaScript code you will embed in your files on the server, maybe even your PHP files on the server or .js files, but they are going to be shipped raw over the internet to the user's browser. And it's the user's browser that has to have support for JavaScript in it, which thankfully is the case with all major browsers. Some references here that you might want to take a look at over time, although the problem set will certainly walk you through what you need to know. So, how do you go about using JavaScript in your own code? Well, our goal here today is to one, give you a teaser of some of the silly things you can do, but then also the much more sophisticated things. It wasn't that long ago that JavaScript code was rather relegated to stupid things like generating pop ups, which thankfully have、um, almost, except for that pop up last week, become a thing of the past,、um, doing stupid Things like popping up little alerts and generally annoying the user. Well, JavaScript is mature, and it's things like Google Maps that have really leveraged the language and pushed it to be a much more sophisticated, a much more compelling language. So, how do you use it? Well, we said last week that inside of a web page is the head and the body, at least. And in the head can go the title tag and a couple other things, and among them is A script tag. So, if you want to embed a bit of JavaScript programming code in a web page, you just paste something like that inside of your head tag. And then where I have the dot, dot, dot is where you can start writing JavaScript code. And we'll fill that blank in in just a moment. Alternatively, you can tell the browser, you know what? I'm not going to sort of sloppily embed all of my JavaScript in the, HTML, the XHTML page itself. Rather, you go pull it up. As a separate file. And this keeps things much cleaner than it does embedding everything in one place. Very similar to CSS, if you're already familiar. And we glanced at that last week in the form of .css files. So, nicely enough, JavaScript is very similar to C and very similar to,、C um, to PHP. I excerpted from the documentation for JavaScript some of the most useful, some of the most basic constructs. And you should see some familiar things break, const, continue, do while, for.、Uh, there's some things that are a little foreign to C for each. And so forth, but there's ifs and elses and returns. So, in short, you already know most of the language, and it's just going to be a matter of figuring out you know, what the minor syntactic differences are and how the code is sort of fundamentally handled differently by a browser versus a command line、uh, environment. So, let's do something by way of example. So, this is a bunch of cryptic looking JavaScript code, but it doesn't do all that、uh, much. That's interesting, but it does do something that's useful. So, how it doesn't happen that often, fortunately, but if, can you think of any experience where you've been on some web page and you have some form that you need to fill out, perhaps to log in, and you start typing, and all of a sudden you realize you know, nothing's happening? And that's for the simple, stupid reason that you haven't clicked here to start typing. Now, this is kind of a stupid user interface deficiency if I have to sort of proactively click where the web page should already know I'm going to start typing anyway. So, what this snippet of JavaScript code does for us is very simply move the cursor at the moment the page is loaded to the field that you want the user to start typing in. So, it's with JavaScript that you can do these kinds of logical things. So, how does this work? Well, if this gets embedded inside of the user's Head tag in their web page, notice what's happening here. So the comments kind of explain, but what we have is the notion in a web page of the web page being what's called a document. That's pretty straightforward. Now, web pages can have XHTML forms. So it turns out that if you simply specify document.forms, this gives you access to, sort of like a variable would, all of the forms in the web page. Now, forms can have names. In the open bracket form element, you can say open bracket form space. Name equals quote unquote foo. So if you instead call it something useful, like this is the login form, well, the syntax for accessing the form called login in a web page is just to name it after the dot. And then if you know there's an input field in that form called username, if the form open bracket input name equals quote unquote username, well, you just go one step further with the dot notation. And then if you actually want to control the value of that field, you just go into dot value. So this is a very long winded way of saying that this sort of path, document.forms.login.username, gets you closer and closer and closer and closer to the actual text field that you care about. Now, what is this doing? What do you think this check is doing? Yeah, it's just saying if there's no username already there, what do you want to do? Well, go ahead and go to that same place, document.forms.login.username, 
and call apparently a function that exists. So it turns out in JavaScript, there's a whole bunch of functions that are sort of automatically associated with elements of the web page. One of them is a function called focus, and as the name kind of implies, that just means give this element focus, move the cursor here essentially. So what this is saying is focus in on that field. And I'm going to ignore the second line for now because it's、uh, sort of a necessary hack.、Um, this line here, though, is saying else, what should you focus on instead? So, the password field. So, what's the end result? Well, if I sort of screw up and type mail in with the wrong password and click login, if we're using JavaScript code like this, when the page returns, not only will it pre populate the field username with what I typed in, but it will also put the cursor where I need it. So, a simple thing, right? This is not something to write home about, but it hints at exactly what the syntax is for controlling this page. You can do things a little more cleanly, too. This was kind of a nuisance doing something, dot something, dot something. Well, it turns out that you can assign to most any element. Any tag in an XHTML page, an ID attribute. So if you instead say something like input uh, uh, name equals quote unquote username, ID equals quote unquote username, then you can use a built in JavaScript function called document.getElementById and grab that specific. Tag that specific element directly. You can store it in a variable as we've done here. Apparently, in JavaScript, to declare a variable, you say var and then the name of it. So, a little different from before. And now we can just use much simpler syntax. If username.value equals equals nothing, focus, else go ahead and focus on. The password field instead. Now, incidentally, and this is where you sort of get into the aesthetics of web page design, which is beyond the scope of this course's interest, but this little hack here, username.value gets username.value, has the stupidly annoying effect of doing the following. If we actually kept the cursor here, calling focus in many browsers puts the cursor at the beginning of the line instead of the end of the line, and empirically, the hack for that is to just set the, the field's value. Equal to itself, and browsers then move the cursor to the right. So you learn little stupid things like this. And this is why we turn you to Google and the like to solve some of these less interesting problems. Now let's solve something more interesting that's actually compelling and something you might integrate into your project. So here's an example form that's got an email field, a password field, ask for it again, and then some kind of checkbox. So it integrates some of the ideas of our forms from last week. Well, this is an example that we have in today's printout under forms. And I'm going to go ahead and open up form1.html. Meanwhile, I'm going to go over to that page. So, that we can actually see this thing in action. And let's just get a taste of exactly how this stuff works. So, in forms, form1.html is the printout you have. You have the printout, not of course, of what it looks like, but rather what's underneath the hood. So, we have a form tag here. We have a action attribute of process.php. So, that's the thing that's going to handle the submission using the method get. And then we've just got a very quickly whipped up page. Email is this input. Password is this input. And then notice I'm giving the two password fields two different names so that I can actually distinguish the two and some other XHTML. All right, so why is this, what's this going to do? Well, let's try nothing. Click Submit. All right, so interestingly, and actually let me see if I can remove our cookies so that this is not a distraction. So we use on CS50.net. All right, let's see how to best explain this. Uh huh, uh huh, where'd it go? Explain it by starting over. All right, lecture. Wow, you can kind of feel that this lecture has ground to a halt, hasn't it? <laughs> all right, submit. Damn. All right, so what's going on here? So, all the process.php has done for me is output the contents of a variable that last week we said gives us access to stuff that's been submitted. So, we, last week we called this thing dollar sign underscore get, which is a、uh, key value set of everything that was passed in via a get string. There's also something called dollar sign underscore post. If you want to get everything, irrespective of whether they were in get or post, just so you can be a bit lazy, dollar sign underscore request also exists. So, that's why when we submit this form, All we're seeing is what's inside that array. And email is nothing, password is nothing, PHP sesh ID is something. And then all of this stuff is the result of our using on the course's website, Google Analytics, which, long story short, plops some cookies on your browser anytime you visit cs50.net so that we can maintain statistics on usage. And that's why you're seeing them as well, because they show up in, cookie, in the cookie variable. But let's see if I can now hide that by just changing this to get and then reload. And there we go. 
So that was the point trying to be made. All right. So very interesting in that it seems to do something. Let's try this. Password of something, password of something, agree to those terms, submit. What's interesting is this is what just got submitted. So we have access server side in the PHP file to all of these fields, and apparently this is what the browser submits if the box was in fact checked. Well, there's no validation here, right? This might not even be a valid email. These, these passwords certainly aren't equivalent. So let's go ahead and take a look at something a little fancier. This time, let's click submit on form2.html. And now we actually have some kind of error checking. You must provide an email address. So, conceptually, given the example we just did with the login page, how could you go about, you know, high level terms, checking for that condition if the email address was in fact blank? What are you looking for? Yeah, so if there's a null value in that field. So notice that this is the HTML for this page, and we saw that a moment ago. So this is just the form. But notice, as I promised, you can put this JavaScript code in the head of a web page. And so here it's nice and self contained. I didn't bother putting it in a separate file. And notice what we've done. So for now, just know that if you want to include JavaScript at the top of a page, you have to copy paste this stuff. And then if you want to define a function, something a little new in JavaScript and in PHP, is that you have to explicitly say function. You don't just start writing it. But there's no notion of a return value, unlike C. So, slight difference there. But this is a function called validate, and it just does a bunch of branches. So, if the registration form's email field's value is null, well, just alert the user by calling this built in, if annoying, JavaScript function called alert, and then return false. If, though, the password one field is null, go ahead and say the same thing. Else, if password one's value, per here, is not equal to password two's value, go ahead and alert accordingly as well. And then finally, we can use the bang operator if it is not the case that the agreement input is checked. Go ahead and print this as well. So it's all kind of self explanatory, even if you've not seen the syntax before. So the result is if I go ahead and do mailin at post.harvard.edu and let's say test and let's say one, two, three, four, five the second time and check this box, we should now get you must provide the same password twice. So some baby steps. Um, so I hate to end、uh, take a break on such a lame note. Let's take a break. <laughs> I think I'm going to have a drink. <laughs> we'll come back in two minutes. All right, we are back. I am already $2.50 ish cents in the hole. I went ahead and sold my Google share so that I could save my money for the penny stock listed in the problem set. This is Harris、uh, Exploration, which is actually, maybe not surprisingly, really hard to find information on if you Google it.、Um, it only costs one cent at the moment. I'm going to buy a whole bunch of those at the moment. Let's see if I can get away with that. It's going to be a little tight. Actually, let's、uh, change this to one, two, three. Let's see if it goes through. Wow. OK, so it's a half cent. So we're actually using a、uh, different uh, dot uh, percent F format string to display the value here. So that's good. I spent half my money, and now I can play around with something else. So we'll see how well I do with. 999,000 shares. So, of course, there's some things we're not taking into account here if you've taken a couple economics courses. My purchase of、uh, a million shares probably would have affected the stock price just a moment ago. So, there's kind of some assumptions we're making that your behavior has no effect on these penny stocks, not so realistic. But this part is certainly just for fun. So, feel free to play around and see how well you can do. I think last year the record at the end of the course was that our、uh, esteemed winner, a student, Had racked up, starting with $10,000, $250,000 fake dollars、um, as a result of some fancy、um, after hours trading and、uh, other penny stock manipulations. So <laughs> we, we don't try to cover all of the real world meets fake world、um, opportunities, but it's really just for fun. So play around if you would like. So let's see. I think I opened too strong before, so I'm going to start boring and then see if we can work up to some excitement here. So, what can we do better than this particular implementation? So, we left off right here. So, we looked at this thing, which was just you know, a step forward. So, now we're actually validating user input. But it's worth noting here that, relatively easy though it may be to validate user input, to do this error checking client side, what do I probably want to be careful of nonetheless? Like, is this error checking sufficient, put another way? 
I'm seeing head shakes, but why? Back that up. What's that? So you, I am not checking if the email address is syntactically valid or even a legitimate email address. So there's definitely some work, right? Presence of something in the email field certainly doesn't mean it is an actual email. So that's actually a good segue to an example we'll get to in just a moment. But what else is the case, right? What is an HTTP request? Well, we saw last week when we were just sniffing the traffic with live HTTP headers that it was really just a string. And you can mimic strings going across the internet. In fact, that's precisely what we're doing in problem set seven. The means by which we are getting stock quotes from Yahoo for you is to pretend like your helpers.php file is, in fact, a browser. And we're sending an HTTP request, albeit from、uh, PHP code. And then the web server, finance.yahoo.com, just sees it coming in as a plain old HTTP request. It responds to it as though we're a browser, even though we're a line of code. So, this is to say, you can mimic the behavior of browsers. So, if you are a malicious user, it's really not all that hard to try breaking into someone's website by not following typical conventions, right? There is no reason I have to submit data to this server via this specific website. Web page, right? It is really not that hard for me to view this page's source,、uh, Control A to highlight all, go ahead and load up my fancy notepad editor, paste it in there, save it to my desktop called, let's say, bad.html. Let's go ahead and go back to my desktop. Now it's living here. It's still got a Firefox icon because you can open local files as though they were web pages. Notice the URL is local, it's on my C drive. But if this thing is configured correctly, which let's take a look at if it is, let me go ahead and edit this. Oh, what a lovely text editor now. All right, so don't use Microsoft Word to edit. Instead, we're going to go to open with a TextPad, which is my preferred editor. Let's see where this thing is designed to submit to. So the form field a moment ago was process.php. So there is a problem here in that there is no PHP file on my local computer. Moreover, there's no web server on my computer, there's no PHP interpreter. But that's OK, because where does this file live? Well, if we just infer from where we were, I think that process.php is just at that address, so I can just make this change in my form. So, what I've done is I've changed the action line to just be not local, but on the internet. And watch what happens. I'll save this. I'll go ahead and reload. I'm going to be play nicely this time. So, now I am in my local copy. I'm going to go ahead and type in mailin at post.harvard.edu. I'll say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Again, one, two, three, four, five. I'll check this box, hopefully passing all four tests. Submit. And notice, I did in fact end up on the server. So, this is to say, especially when you need to start programming defensively, like the TFs aren't trying to be mean just because we sort of get off on deducting points. Like, this is a necessary thing when it comes to solving problems with code. You need to worry about cases that are unanticipated. You need to worry about people with way too much free time trying to hack into your program, trying to hack into your server. And it's precisely via these realities that people can do that by simulating what you might expect. Should be coming from an actual file on the internet, not your own site. So let's see if we can't do a little better than this implementation. Let's go back to、um, our form, not two, but three.html. And let's see how this one behaves by looking at its source. So this one appears to have something, hmm, this just seems to be a little different. So this function called validate this time appears to be taking an argument. So let's actually take a look at how we've done this so that you have yet another approach you can take. So here's my form down here. Oh, and you know what?、We've、neglect What I neglected to point out before? So there was one interesting line of code down here in the web page. So here's the form that I glossed over a moment ago. And just so this all fits on the screen, let me move this here. White space does not matter to the browser. Notice that this is familiar. Open bracket form. Action equals quote unquote process.php. Method is get. Name equals registration. But here's the magic. What you can include in most elements. Tag declarations in XHTML are what are called event handlers. And one such event handler, as the name it states right there, is onSubmit. So if you add the onSubmit attribute to the form element, as its name kind of suggests, whatever's in quotes is going to get executed. On submission, the moment that submit button is clicked or the user hits enter. Well, what's going to happen is you are going to, there's a little snippet of JavaScript code here. You are going to return whatever the validate function returns. So the reason here is if I did this, the easiest way to prevent your form from ever being submitted is to say this return false. 
because the browser is going to try to submit. It's going to call this line of code, return false, and say, ooh, false. I'm not going to proceed any further. To make this more real, this is form2.html, which I've just saved the changes to. Let me go ahead and click submit. You can do it all day long. Nothing's actually going to happen because I've overridden that. Whereas if I put return true, it would go through. But I don't want to do that. I sort of want to conditionally return true or false based on the return value of this function. And that is why I was returning true or false previously. So now fast forward to form 3.html. The only difference thus far is the presence of this f attribute. Well, what does this mean? It denotes form, but what does that mean? Well, just know that another approach, and you'll see this likely in Google's APIs, things like this, is that what you can also specify is not only return validate, but there's this notion of this. So if you came from AP Computer Science and the world of Java, you know about the this pointer, the this reference. It's this feature of object-oriented programming. And JavaScript is, in fact, an object-oriented programming language. What this means is that much of its world is modeled sort of similar in spirit to structs. So C has structs, which allow you to keep related pieces of data together. Well, now imagine that there's a world in which you can keep not only related pieces of data together, but also related functions together that all kind of do related things. And it's just nice for the programmer to assume that they can all be accessed via a one struct. Very similar in spirit to our G struct in the uh, Sudoku implementation. We wanted to clump together a whole bunch of related variables. Well, now imagine you want to clump together related functions. And an object oriented programming languages, among other things, let you do exactly that. So it turns out that when you are inside of an element like form, as denoted by the presence of open bracket form, you are currently inside of an object. And that object is a form object. So just think of it sort of as a, some kind of chunk of memory representing a form that has properties associated with it, and even functions, aka methods associated with it. So this line of code is simply saying call validate function, but pass in a pointer to this element. That is, clue this function called validate into who I am by telling him proactively. The re implication is that up here, notice what we don't have to bother doing. We don't have to do something like we did before if document.forms. Uh, dot registration, right? In the previous example, we were sort of proactively finding what we wanted. In this example, we're pulling what we want from the variable. We're being told proactively what it is we want to check the value of. And so f, in this case, represents an element called form. And so this is equivalent, essentially, to all of this messiness that we had before because at the moment this validate function was called, this is was this. I have no clean way of saying that. that. This is synonymous at that point in the code with that string. And so it allows us to avoid typing that again. So f.email is still similar to what we did before. Dot value gives us the actual value. f.password1, f.password1, and f.agreement, all same as before, but this different fundamental approach. So the ultimate result is the same. So I won't bother running the code because it won't do anything different, but it's a different approach. But here's something that's actually a bit neater. So in form four, we get fancier. Notice, this form button doesn't do anything, but it doesn't even depress. So you can disable form elements as well. So just as objects can have functions associated with them, they can also have variables, aka properties associated with them. So the submit button, any button in XHTML, has a disabled property associated with it, but that by default is false. But if you set disabled equal to true, that means the field is not touchable. You can't edit it, you can't click it. And that's exactly what I've done here. Because in form 4.html, notice that where I define my checkbox, which is just another input type that looks like this, input name equals agreement, notice type equals quote unquote checkbox, on click equals, t oh, uh, ch -ch -ch oh, sorry, form button. So the input is the form button. Notice that I'm saying disabled equals quote unquote disabled. So this is for stupid legacy reasons. Back in the day of what was called HTML, you didn't need to have attributes followed by equal signs, followed by quoted strings. That was sort of the loose, in the loose days of the 1990s. And so you would just say input space disabled. The world needed a way to sort of force people to be more formal with XHTML. And the convention they came up with wasn't to do something maybe more obvious like this but to say you equal yourself in quotes. Just know that that's the way it's done. So the name of this thing is going to be button. The type is submit and the value is submit, but it is in fact disabled, which is why I can't even click on it. But notice this. 
Input name equals agreement has this other event handler associated with it. And this is what's actually neat because we can programmatically respond to changes of the web page, changes of these objects. So on click, apparently a function called toggle is going to get invoked. Well, let's see what that is. Up here is a function called toggle. And let's see. So if document.forms.registration.button.disabled, so that's a property of the object called button. Which is kind of a child, so to speak, of registration, which is a child of the forms, which is a child of the document itself. If that returns true, that is, it is disabled, well, we want to invert its value by setting it equal to false, and else we want to set it to true. So the net result is if you click this button, watch the aesthetics of the submit button. It actually becomes clickable. Clickable, not clickable, back and forth. Just because we're actually having something go on programmatically behind the scenes. Well, incidentally, Lest I forget this later, there does exist a JavaScript debugger. The problem set will walk you through this. So if you worry that you're giving up such tools as this, or if you never actually use GDB,、um, know that here's another tool you can never actually use.、Um, <laughs> yes, we know. <laughs> Um, now let's take this one step further. One step further. Form5.html. This one is just so fancy. Watch this. So now my email address is going to be、uh, ASDF, as is often typed in. Password will be legit, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, both times. I'm going to go ahead and check the box and now click Submit. Ooh, interesting. You must provide a .edu email address. So it turns out that JavaScript, like PHP, which we mentioned last week, supports something called regular expressions. And these are hugely valuable when it comes to validation of users' data and even other tricks still, when you actually have to massage the user's input into a prescribed format. So consider this. You've probably visited some website at one point that asks you for a credit card number or like an expiration date. And it goes so far as to say, give me the expiration date in zero,、uh, XX slash YY. And if you just say XX YY, it chokes. It says, sorry, that's an invalid format. I don't understand it. Or、uh, even the Harvard Registrar's Office asks you to input the times when you're setting up sections in military format, e- because they didn't want to support the notion of AM or PM. But these things are so easily handled if you have the ability to kind of analyze the user's input and make changes to it, or at least validate it. So, for instance, what I've added now to form5.html is one line of code. So, if document.forms.registration.email fields value, So, notice that value again is itself, even though it conceptually it looks like just a blinking cursor, it looks like a blank text field, even those text fields, even values, can have functions associated with them, methods, again, that's synonymous for us today, associated with them. So, value is just a string. So, I've been calling it just a value, but it is just a string, and a string is an object, it turns out, like a struct, and because objects can have things associated with them, So, can strings. One of the functions that comes with the string class,、uh, with string objects, is called match. And what you do, if a bit cryptically, is you provide between forward slashes as the parameter to this thing a regular expression. And this is something we'll defer to various online tutorials and sections for some sophistication. But you can kind of infer what this means even without using these, having used these things before. Dot, I think I did say last week, denotes what? Any character. This is like sort of the star operator of regular expressions, but in a different way. So dot means any character, plus means one or more. So what this means is one or more of something, followed by an at sign, followed by one or more of something, whatever it is, followed by, why do you think I'm doing backslash dot here? You have to escape it, right? It's a literal period. We don't want to say, let anything be here. We want a dot, so we escape it, followed by edu. And then the dollar sign is kind of a neat syntax because it lets me say, make sure that the end of the string is dot edu. So dollar sign denotes the right hand side of the string. If I really wanted to be anal, I could have said at the front of this regular expression, the caret symbol. And even though there's sort of no symmetry here, the caret symbol means start matching at the front of the string. The dollar sign means start matching at the end of the string. So collectively, this means the whole string must now match this pattern. So the reason that this did not validate when I just typed in ASDF is because I was missing what? The dot edu. So unfortunately, we're not completely、um, legit here. So ASDF at, let's say, dot dot edu. Let's see if we can get away with that. OK, a y so we did. 
And that's illegitimate. And actually, this is perhaps topical. Those of you guys who have been signing up rapidly for those college.harvard.edu addresses, um, our own, one of our own teaching fellows, who I'll let remain nameless, um, being the sort of prototypical uh, adversary, decided it'd be fun to mess with FAS. And so when the, this particular nameless teaching fellow sitting to the left of me, um, one of them actually signed up for a Harvard College email address. Apparently, you guys can choose from first name dot last name or first name dot middle initial dot last name. Well, whoever it is implementing the college's system uh, didn't actually check the user's input very well. And so this TF was able to say, I want to use first name, middle name, last name uh, with the dots in between. Um, this TF doesn't have a middle name. So he just left it blank. And so he got a user, an email address of the form first name dot dot last name at such and such. This is invalid syntactically. Mail servers should reject email sent to an address like that. And so sure enough, he didn't get e an email for like a week. Um, that's an ex oh, he, he's left. All right, so he's not here. We can say anything we want now. Um, so anyhow, apparently that's been fixed. But it just speaks to sort of, you know, it's not obvious sometimes how you solve these problems. So just kind of thinking of the regular expressions that you need to use is an interesting problem. And if you even like the idea of this pattern matching, CS121, which you can take in the fall, talks about things called uh, deterministic finite automata. And these are sort of conceptual machines with which you can implement something like a regular expression matching function. So. Enough on that to give you a sense of um, form validation. Let's dive into something a little sexier. So uh, regular expressions, for more on that, you can check out those URLs there. Let's talk about some of the fundamentals before we look at something called AJAX, which is sort of all the rage these days. So know now that JavaScript has a whole bunch of global objects, so to speak. So these are sort of JavaScript's data types. And JavaScript comes with arrays, booleans, dates, functions. And notice the capital letter. Anything in JavaScript that starts with a capital letter is one of these things called a global object. This is useful to know because associated with each of these objects is a whole bunch of functions. So if you actually go to this URL at the bottom of this slide, um, if you pull up the version online, it'll be more readable. You'll be able to see what string functions exist and what functions exist related to arrays and so forth. Hey, if you want to go ahead and sort an array in JavaScript, you call the sort function. You don't implement uh, selection sort, merge sort, bubble sort yourself. You call a function that someone else has written. Similarly, do you do that in PHP? So what is an object exactly in JavaScript? Well, JavaScript isn't quite like Java, and they are completely unrelated. Um, if you read the Wikipedia article or do a bit of Googling, you'll see that rumor has it um, when JavaScript was introduced um, uh, essentially by Netscape, one of the browsers back in the day, that, that organization, they named it JavaScript supposedly to sort of ride the coattails of another popular language called Java. They are completely unrelated other than sharing that common prefix. So uh, it's common misspeak to say you know Java when you're programming JavaScript and vice versa. Un un uh, unhelpful aside. So what is helpful about JavaScript? Well, is its support for what are called objects. Objects are just containers that you can put stuff in. So uh, an object in JavaScript allows you to associate a key with a value. So in this sense, an object in JavaScript is really just like an associative array in PHP. It's a hash table of sorts. And this is why, using this very basic idea that inside some chunk of memory, called, called an object here, you can associate keys with values, what this means is you can associate variables with objects. You can give a variable a name and give it a value. But you can also associate functions with objects, because functions have names and functions have implementations, right? The actual code that implement them. So you can think of the function's name as the key and the lines of code you wrote to implement that function as the value. So JavaScript is nice in that it has this very simple framework conceptually in which everything, almost everything in JavaScript is an object. Functions are objects, even though we won't focus so much on why that's the case, but functions are objects. And things like strings are objects. The syntax with which you can put things in objects is very simply the object's name dot key equals value or more familiar, more like PHP, object square bracket quote unquote key. So in other words, this line here is to say that JavaScript supports associative arrays just like PHP, but this syntax here with the dot notation 
is equivalent. So you've seen a whole bunch of dot notation today. It's equivalent to this bracketed notation、uh, in many contexts as well. Even further, can you specify things like this? If you say, I want an object, well, curly braces denote here comes an object. If you want to then map key to value, you just do key colon value and then semicolon, key colon value, semicolon. And this will be useful when you start looking at Google's APIs for problem set eight. Well, a JavaScript also has arrays, which can be automatically numerically indexed. To get an array in JavaScript, you either declare it with this first line of code here, which is perhaps self explanatory. This is a bit new, and this is a bit new, but for those of you coming from, again, AP Computer Science, this is essentially a constructor. If you're familiar with the jargon, if you're not, it doesn't matter.、Um, if you take CS51, 61, these topics might come up again.、Um, this is synonymous. The quicker, easier way,、uh, the 2008 way of declaring an array is just to say o- two open brackets. And then if you want to put stuff in this array, you just use A bracket 0 equals this, A bracket 1 equals bar equals this, and so forth. So, also, this is kind of a neat trick, too. What was one of the pains about arrays in C when it came to dynamism and adding stuff to them? They run out of space, right? They are of fixed size. So, wonderfully, PHP resizes arrays for you. And in that sense, arrays in PHP are better called vectors, because vectors means they automatically resize. Same thing in JavaScript. If you add something, To an, index, in, to an index in the array that doesn't yet exist, JavaScript doesn't seg fault or create some error. It puts it there for you. It grows the array to be that big. Even if you put in a bracket 1000, it will just grow the array for you, put that new element over here, and leave you with a whole bunch of blank, wasted space, but it won't crash on you. So, this is a little trick with which you can add things to arrays. And you'll see this too throughout people's APIs. At this point in the story, what's the length of A? Zero, right? There's nothing in it. So a bracket a dot length. It turns out that for arrays, the object called array, there's a property, a variable called length, and obviously it's zero at this point. So a bracket a dot length is like saying a bracket zero gets foo. But the moment you use the assignment operator, that grows the array implicitly. So now a dot length is one, which means calling the same piece of code again. Has the effect of doing a bracket one gets this, a bracket two gets this. So these are these little pieces of almost syntactic sugar, again, little tricks that frankly just make the coding process so much more fun, so much less painful because you can just get work done more quickly without jumping through hoops. Now, what about all the things you can do in the context of web pages? Well, there's a whole bunch of event handlers which really lend themselves to interactive user experiences. So, Gmail has totally kicked the butt of all the other webmail implementations out there because they have made such good use of things like event handlers, such good use of a technology called Ajax, so that you have really have a seamless experience. Even Google Maps. Apps, I would claim, was leaps and bounds better than MapQuest and Yahoo initially because they told the simple fact that you could click and drag and you didn't have to reload the whole damn page or click an up arrow just to get another square of the map was just a huge leap forward in terms of user experience. And all of these websites these days, even Facebook now, when you get that little progress bar and when you click right. Um, in the photos page, and everything just kind of slides instead of reloading the whole page, they are now increasingly using Ajax for a better user experience and in part for greater efficiency. You can send fewer bits across the wire. So you can detect things like is the keyboard, is the key, is some key down? Is the mouse over something? Is the mouse button down? Has the user selected something? Have they resized something? Have they submitted something? You can associate these kinds of event handlers with a whole bunch of XHTML. Uh, attributes, CSS properties. So even if you're not even really sure what CSS is, because we really don't do it justice at all in this course, because we don't care so much about aesthetics, but more about programmatics, well, CSS can be manipulated using JavaScript. So, long story short, every element in a web page can have CSS, cascading style sheet properties associated with it, like that element's font name, font size, font color, all of those kinds of aesthetics. Well, what's neat about JavaScript in the context of CSS is that you can control one with the other. You can change the aesthetics of your web page programmatically without having to regenerate it all server side, which means much more can happen client side. So, you'll recall last week that we actually had a 
uh, one of our uh, teaching fellows holding office hours during lecture and we had the thing blinking saying in progress, in progress. Well the blink tag has long been deprecated. Many browsers just don't support it anymore but as I claimed last week I wanted to re-implement it. Right? Just because I wanted to draw our attention to office hours being in progress. Now how could you go about implementing this idea in JavaScript? Well if you have the ability to control the aesthetics of a web page, you would probably have the ability to control the color of it or whether it's showing true or not showing false. And so all it took for me to re-implement the blink tag was to write a JavaScript function and attach it to that chunk of code in the web page, the div element as it was. So this function, which I called blinker, does the following. It goes ahead and finds all elements in the page that I named blink. So literally anywhere in the page where I wanted some div element to blink, I just did something, and my handwriting will be poor here, div uh, space name equals quote unquote, really bad, <laughs> blink. Harvard education here. Name equals blink. So what does that do? Well this function, similar to get element by ID, singular, get element by ID, get elements plural by name, returns an array of all of the objects in the web page that have that name blink. So this is useful because I can make a whole bunch of things blink if I really want. What I'm going to do now in this next line of code is something pretty familiar syntactically. For variable i gets zero, iterate from i up to the length of the array return. So blinks.length is the length of the array, i plus plus. And now thanks to CSS and this intermingling of JavaScript with CSS, I can say if blinks i's style visibility property equals equals visible, well I want to toggle it to be hidden. Else if it's not visible, I want to make it visible by setting it equal to visible. And then all it takes, so this function in and of itself doesn't make anything blink in the manner the website tends to. What does this function literally make an element do? Toggle, right? It changes its state to be visible or not visible. So we have to wrap this thing either in a loop and then have kind of some sleep function pausing every second or half second so that we get a blink effect again and again. And JavaScript does provide exactly that. You have timeout functions and other functions that you can say uh, spawn a thread a la scratch from weeks ago and wake up every half second or every second and do this, then go back to sleep, then do this and go back to sleep. And that's precisely how we implemented this, this novel if annoying blink tag. So we'll leave it there. On Wednesday we will continue with Ajax.